So, this is a speaker meeting. Our speaker will share his experience, strength, and hope for approximately 45 minutes. We ought to ask out of respect for our speaker to please remain seated until he has finished. It is my pleasure to introduce Brian. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Edwards. I'm a fully conceited alcoholic. <laughs> Good to see you all. Uh, maybe the first meeting I've ever been to that hasn't been prepared for a drinker. This <laughs> is drinks. Um, I, uh, it's good to be here. Um, thank you, Nan. It's always an honor and a privilege to share in Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't like that when I got here. Um, uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, my sobriety date is uh, March 5th, 1986, and for that I'm truly grateful. Um, probably like most of you, I hadn't planned on getting sober that day, week, month, year, decade. Um, but uh, it was, it's turned out to be my greatest gift, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. Um, so I'm probably, I'll say this up front, I'm probably going to piss a few of you off tonight, um, yes. all of which is uh, good, um, because, um, you know, there are a lot of things that we hear in Alcoholics Anonymous that aren't true, and so I've, I'm going to share my experience, strength, and hope, which is hopefully close to my truth, and uh, that sometimes pisses people off, which is all right. Um, so the first thing, probably the first place I'll piss people off is I think there's probably a fair number of newcomers. How, how many people have uh, five or fewer years of sobriety? All right, so the, the, the vast majority, and the reason I ask that question is uh, I was told we were new for our first five years, and I believe that today. Uh, took me, a, as a guy described to me, it takes about two years to detox and about another three years to get my brain out of hock. And um, in my case, it might have actually taken a little longer. But I do believe that the first five years were new. And the problem is, after five years, between five and ten are kind of like the desert years of sobriety. A lot of people, their lives come together, you know, those first five years, and they think, I've got it, I don't need to go to AA, I'm, I've kind of way overdid that AA thing. I've got this now, I've got money in the bank, no one's pissed off at me anymore, I've cleaned up my criminal record, I've had a job for three weeks, I'm good to go. <laughs> and, um, and so a lot of people leave between five and ten, and a lot of them drink. And some come back, they go through the desert, they hit a, some sort of bottom, sober, and they're finally able to kind of slither back into Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, if you knew, I hope you don't have to do that. That wasn't my experience. And I'm really grateful for that too, because I've seen a lot of people over the time I've been sober do that. They leave Alcoholics Anonymous, they forget where we came from. There's a, a slogan that we don't really talk about that says, lest we forget. And, um, you know, we'll talk, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how the problem of the alcoholic center is in the mind rather than the body. And so one of the things that my mind tells me is I've got this, right? And um, I, that, my life, that unmanageability was just kind of a phase that I was going through, you know, and now I've got it. And... We're, we're good to go. So um, so if you got pissed off because you were told you, and you're like a year sober and you realize you've got another four years to go before you're not really a newcomer anymore, it's all right, you know? <laughs> we, we have to get through five years to get five years, right? And not that time's a, in, time is important. And it, you know, if you think it's easy to get time in Alcoholics Anonymous, try and get some, right? Um, <laughs> but time is not the goal in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? It's about how we live our lives. At least that's been my experience, right? And I'm really grateful for every day I've had sober. I never want to live one day, one of those days again, um, because who wants to hit, rinse, and repeat on like alcoholism, right? So I'm really grateful for every every day that I've had, but I want I don't want to live any one of them again. And um, so I'll start a little bit with my drinking, just kind of qualify, make sure I'm in the right place. Um, <laughs> I am. Um, 
I didn't start drinking alcohol until I was 17. And, and the only reason that I waited that long was I was in a boarding school from about the age of 13 to look through the end of high school. And I actually got to break my duck of uh, drinking right before I graduated high school. My, my mom died a few weeks before, like where I, I grew up in South Africa, so I might as well qualify that. Grew up in a whole different part of the world. And so our, our education system was a little different. At the end of your final year um, in high school, you have a series of exams that kind of determine the rest of your life, right, to a large extent. And so my mom died right before that. And I was really close to my mom. I was an only child. And it was devastating for me. And so at a funeral, a couple of these guys that worked for my dad kind of did me a favor, but not so much, as it turned out. They started feeding me drinks. You know, they knew that I was hurting, um, and uh, they could obviously see the pain in me, and so they fed me a couple drinks. And, you know, I remember that feeling of those drinks going down. Like, I wasn't conscious of it, but I remember it once I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's where I learned that what alcohol could do for me, right? It kind of helped me deal with the pain of my mom's death and, and helped me just kind of keep breathing in and out, right? Because I was, I was, I was really uh, brought, to my le my, brought to my knees by that. And it wasn't until um, my alcoholism kicked in, which probably did that day, that I got to see what alcohol did to me, right? <coughs> so one, there's one thing what it does, does for me, and that kind of takes the edge off life, right? And then what's, what it does to me, and it just takes me wherever it's going to take me, you know? And I always liken, for an alcoholic, drinking like climbing into a cage with an 800-pound gorilla. Like, I'm not getting out the cage, back out the cage again until the gorilla's done with me, right? And that's what al alcoholism turned, to be, turned out to be like um, for me. And, um, and it started on that day. And, you know, like now I realize in a sense that that day I started drinking as an alcoholic, which you don't, that's the problem with alcoholism, right? It's not like a lot of other illnesses where you can diagnose it without taking the alcohol. In order to find out if you're an alcoholic, you have to drink. And so if I'd known then, well, I still would have had the drink, but I didn't know that really what we do when we start drinking as alcoholics is we sign our own death warrant. Because this is a fatal, progressive, fatal illness. You know, I always, so I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I knew everything about everything, including what alcoholism was, right? An alcoholic is someone, I, I sobered up in LA, we'll talk about how I got there in a minute, but I sobered up in LA and and I thought that an alcoholic was someone who slept under the pier or under the bridge or, you know, like was homeless and had a, you know, a jacket and kind of hid alcohol in the brown paper bag. Kind of the, uh, I guess, prototypical, what a lot of us think alcoholics are, right? And I was no different from that. And so when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I learned again, or starting, I guess, from that point on, that I didn't really know much about anything, right? I thought I knew everything about everything, but I really didn't, I didn't know what an alcoholic was. And I so I had no, I was an alcoholic because I didn't measure up on that scale that I had, right? And so when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I got introduced to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and shown what alcoholism is, not what I think it is, and then I measured myself on that blueprint, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a fatal case of this illness, you know? And I'm really grateful for that, and we'll talk about how I got to that point. So, um, so the way it happened for me was, that, you know, I took the drink, and and then the drink took the drink, and then the drink took me, and so I was under the spell of alcohol until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous about ten years later, and um, literally alcohol did with me what it wanted to do. Who I hung out with, where I went, what I did, when I did it, when I didn't do it. It was all driven by alcohol, you know, and I didn't understand that at the time because, you know, in the beginning I had a lot of fun drinking, right? A lot of good times. I had some great friends. We all drank. We were young. Um, you know, I got to go to college, um, even though, you know, those exams were real tough for me after my mom died. I did, did get into college, and so I did go to college, and I met, you know, I've still got, I'm still in contact with some of those guys and, and girls as well. Um, all these years later, but uh, alcohol became more important than anything else I did in college, you know, and I didn't see that until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, so what happened out of that was I, I got a degree but no real education, right? It's kind of hard to get an education if you're not going to class. 
And so, um, but I knew how to take exams, right? I knew how to take tests. And, and so, you know, my, my alcoholism progressed really quickly. I, um, I hit a bottom uh, drinking, you know, like every day. <laughs> and so I made a decision one day that um, the problem is where I live and who I live with, and it's time to go. And so I went, you know, and um, I claimed the AA Geographic Award. I moved from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, to Los Angeles, which is about halfway around the world. And I've been in AA a long time. I've been to thousands of meetings, and I haven't meet, met anyone who's uh, moved any further than that. It's about 12,000 miles. And, um, you know, I remember getting to LA, and I thought that was going to be the solution to my problems. And, you know, I just picked up with a new set of people, man, and a new set of places, new drinks, got introduced to drugs, you know, which are part of my story. Thank God for drugs. They brought me to my knees quicker. But I'm a, I'm a juice junkie, man. I love to drink alcohol. And um, I'm a blackout drinker, and nothing good happens to me in a blackout. And, um, you know, I didn't know until I got to Alcoholics Anonymous that blackouts were I thought, like, everyone blacked out, you know. It never occurred to me that other people didn't do it. And so, you know, I moved to you – know, I'm always trying to – fix my alcoholism, right? So I tried moving. Um, I then tried marriage. Anyone else tried marriage to solve their alcoholism? Um, I met my v victim number one in a bar in L.A. <laughs> and um, we had a whirlwind uh, hostage situation. And, um, but what came out of that, uh, out of that uh, first marriage is I got a sobriety date. And I'm truly grateful for that. She... Um, she had a friend who said that she was drinking too much, and I agreed absolutely that that was the cause of the problems in the marriage. And, um, and she went into a treatment center in, in uh, Redondo Beach, California. And out of that, I got a sobriety date, and I'm so grateful for that. We both stayed sober about 10 years. We had the same sobriety date for about 10 years, and she went back to drinking, and I'm not sure where she is now. I hope all is well for her. But I stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and... And for whatever reason, you know, when I look back at it, I didn't realize how badly alcohol had beaten me. Like, alcohol beat me badly, you know. Like, I was beaten by the bottle by the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I probably, I knew that there was something wrong. I tried marriage. I tried moving. I tried quitting smoking. Um, I tried all these things to solve the problems in my life. And it wasn't until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous that people showed me that, dude, your drinking is not normal. That is not normal drink. In fact, it's far from it. And by the way, if you keep drinking like you're drinking, you're probably going to die. And, um, and I, I could see that. You know, I'm a, I'm a risky drinker. I love to drink and drive. It's one of the many things I like to do. Because a guy, when I was in college, told me I was the best drinker and driver out of all our friends. And I took that as a, a badge of honor. And, um, and so, I, you know, I was always going to be the guy who drank and drove. And... and um, I don't know if there is such thing as a good drinker and driver, but um, it's a you know it's a potentially fatal situation, right? And I didn't care if there were kids in the back, like three-year-olds, <laughs> didn't really matter. My my first uh, ex-wife had a little girl, and she was about 18 months or two years old, and I'd regularly drive with her, drunk in the car, you know. So um, in fact, my bottom in, entailed that little girl. One Friday night. Um, and uh, by the way, the bottom was not when I surrendered. The bottom was when it didn't get in, couldn't get much lower than that. So this little girl's a Friday night. Her mom went out drinking with her friends. I stayed home to babysit her. About 8 o'clock, I got pissed off with that and decided I need to go out drinking too. And so I called up my buddies and I said, let's go drinking. And they said, well, what about Ashley is her name? And I said, well, I'll just wake her up and I'll take her with us which I did, you know, an 18 month old, I woke her up, put her in a crib, we walked down to the local bar, and uh, started drinking, and it wasn't until that, that, that guy, the buddy that I, one of the buddies I went with was actually the one that took me to my first AA meeting about five years later, and um, it wasn't until maybe 15 years ago that he, we were talking about it, and he reminded me at the, of the look of, dis and this was a CD bar, by the way, it was not, it was not a nice bar, and he said, he reminded me of the look of disgust on the people who were sitting in that bar when I walked in with that little girl to drink, you know. And, um, and that's kind of the things, you know, I don't really care about anyone's welfare, whether you're two years old or 42 years old. Um, it, your welfare doesn't really matter to me when I want to drink. 
And um, so, ironically, the name of that bar is Re well, it doesn't exist anymore, but it, the the name of the bar was Rebo's, which spelled backwards is sober. Right, and um, God, it gives me goosebumps when I think about that because obviously I had no idea, right, until I got to AA and and would drive by that that bar on the way to uh, meetings eventually, and um, someone pointed out that that was sober backwards. So that was that was my um, that was my bottom point, you know, of alcoholism, and that's where it took me. And you know, I wasn't raised to do that, and I didn't want to do that. But you know, when alcohol is ruling your life, you do what alcohol tells you to do, right? And so, um, anyway, we, she goes through this treatment program, and, and I get the sobriety date, and I, and I get a direction from a counselor that says, if you're serious about this program, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to a men's meeting, and you're going to find a guy who's well, worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're going to ask him to be your sponsor. And so I did that. And um, I, you know, I went to the meeting, and it was my home group for a long time after that. But, I, you know, God, God's weird, man. Like, God was really working in my life. I, I believe I was kind of bitch slapped into sobriety because I, I really wasn't planning on it. And so this guy, I remember clear as day, man. He, he looked good. He was all dressed up. And he sounded good when he shared. And um, I'd seen his wife drop him off at the meeting, and she was pretty. And I'm like, That's a d I want a life like that dude has. You know, and, and but it turned out, you know, because I'm like looking at the outsides, right? Because I'm trying to heal my outsides, and so um, I look at him for, you know, with all the wrong eyes and all the wrong motives. But again, God has a sense of humor, and it turns out he was a big book thump in disguise. And so, when I asked him to um, sponsor me, he didn't like jump all over it, like he wasn't excited that I was asking him to sponsor me. Uh, but he took me to the, we just read the line tonight, and I, I like to call it step, uh, step Zero. It's on page 58 of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's a line that says, if you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. So he wouldn't even take me to step one until I'd made a decision on those two things. Do I want what you have, and am I willing to go to any length to get it? And before I could lie, well, I, I still lied, but he helped me mitigate my lie a little bit. He said, do you want what we have? You, do you see people being sober and happy and free? And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. And he said, but here's the clicker, here's the clincher. Are you willing to go to any length to get it? And he said, here's what we mean by that. Are you willing to do anything we have done or would be willing to do to stay sober? And I really had to think about it. You know, it's like the book also talks about, you know, we, we either choose the spirit, we either go to the gates of insanity or death, or we choose the spiritual life, right? And I'm like, well, how would I die? Would it be quick? You know? <laughs> because this option does not re look real appealing to me. You know what I mean? The spiritual life does not look real appealing to me. And so when he said that to me, I'm like, geez. Because I heard of people who'd like get together with their sponsors every week, and they'd go to like five or six meetings a week. And they were like all in here in this AA thing. And I was like, that's a, that's a lot. I wasn't that fully bought in yet. Um, that's a lot to ask for a guy like me because I'm kind of a special case. And so, um, but again, I was beaten by the bottle. And I knew down here where I lived that the gig was up, right? That if I, and I really believe this is important if you're new and hopefully you've hit this point. And if you haven't, my experience is you'll probably have to drink again to get to the point where you can connect the dots between if I keep drinking and I'm going to die. And I might kill someone along the way if you're a risky driver like me. Or, you know, like do other stupid shit like jump, jump off cliffs or out of airplanes or whatever, drunk. Um, and so, but I, when, when he asked me that question, I think there was a part of me that could see that I could connect those dots that I kept. If I kept on doing this gig I was on, I could easily see myself dying. And um, I didn't really want to die. It didn't sound that unappealing, but it didn't really sound appealing to me. You know? And so that's kind of the dilemma we get to, right? The jumping off place that the book talks about as well. And so for whatever reason, I said, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And, um, and here's what's come out of that. I, um, I did. Like he didn't care about my feelings. He didn't want my input on working the steps on the you know, how quickly we should read the book or how quickly you should go through the steps. He didn't care about any of that. 
All he was concerned about was helping me get through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous so that I could have the spiritual experience that we talk about in the 12th step so that I could recover from alcoholism, which is the first promise in the book. Right on the title page says the story how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. And so I was told that I could recover from alcoholism, you know. But in order to do that, I had to go through the steps, you know. And so he took me through the steps, you know, one at a time, in order, at the pace he he determined, not me. And so, you know, step one was... um, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. I was, um, I just turned 27 years old. I was in the prime of my life. And um, I wasn't powerless, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm not powerless over anything, man. Bring it on, I'll, you know, let's get it on. And, um, but there was a, and, but it really what it was is I didn't understand what we were talking about, powerless over alcohol. Like I thought it was like a physical fight thing, <laughs> right? That I'm gonna fight alcohol somehow. And it wasn't until he took me into the book and showed me what we mean by powerless, right? My mind tells me, I have an obsession of the mind, right? My mind tells me, even when I don't want to drink, that we're drinking. Today, tomorrow, whenever it is, when my mind tells me we're going to drink, we're drinking. Drink time will come. And I didn't understand that because I always thought those times I'd quit drinking, I'd... I'd quit drinking and then I'd start drinking again. I always thought it was because I changed my mind, right? Like I'd overreacted a little bit by stopping drinking. It was the smoking that caused that that last problem. And so let's just quit the smoking, not the drinking. And um, and so he helped me see those those points where I wanted to stop drinking and I would swear off for some period of time, but I'd never meet that time frame, right? I'd always be drinking. And when I thought I changed my mind, he talked about that's an obsession of my, the mind, and it's unique to alcoholics. Normal drinkers don't have that, you know. And so then he talked about once that obsession kicks in, and you take the drink, re- physically we react differently from alcohol than the normal drinker does. And I was like, God, that kind of makes sense because you know I remember like I'd, the book talks about right. I'd have an important engagement to meet. Like in, when I was in college, I'd have an exam or a test or some paper or whatever due, and I really wanted to get it done. Like I had really good intentions to get it done, but we'd go for a couple of drinks before that, and then I wasn't going home until I was out of the, pa- ca- the the gorilla threw me out of the cage, right? And so I'd miss the important date or I'd miss the important commitment or or um, paper or whatever it was, and um, and I, and I saw that. I mean, my life was pretty unmanageable by then. I'd become, I was already unemployable. Well, I was actually unemployable before I left college. Um, but I could see that, right, that when he talked about that, that allergy, that we react differently to alcohol physically than the normal drinker because, like, we'd be drinking and a buddy would say, you know, I've got to go home and pay the bills. I'm like, the bills? Are you kidding me, man? We're in the bar. Who wants to go home and pay the bills? You know, and they'd leave and go home and pay the bills or mow the lawn or whatever they were going to do. And I'm like left in the bar drinking, you know. And I just thought it was, I was kind of a more fun guy than they were, you know. <laughs> I didn't understand that al- I was in the cage. I'm not getting out. And um, and then we got to the second half of the first step, which is um, I think there's a lot of misinterpretation or misunderstanding of what we mean by our lives have become unmanageable. For a long time after I got to AA, and my, this I didn't really learn until I was sober for quite a while, there's two forms of unmanageability. There's an external unmanageability and then the internal unmanageability. And we're talking about the internal unmanageability in the first step. The external man- unmanageability is like DUIs, trouble with the law, trouble with the job, trouble with the wife, kids, neighbors, kind of that external trouble that we get into as alcoholics, right? Now, non-alcoholics, some of them get into that. Heavy drinkers get into that same kind of trouble, right? That external alcohol, you know, just because you get a DUI doesn't mean you're an alcoholic, for example, right? And so that's the external alcoholism, which is always a good symptom of alcoholism. Like if you've got five DUIs, odds are (laughs) you're alcoholic. Um... But that's, that's not the unmanageability we're talking about. The unmanageability we're talking about is the ism in alcoholism, the internal, internal spiritual malady. And the third part of alcoholism, right? Mental, physical, spiritual. And uh, the spiritual malady that, like, I'm restless, irritable, and discontented. That's kind of my baseline. 
And there are only two things that can solve that condition for me. One is alcohol, and the other is a spiritual experience. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous offers me as a solution for my internal spiritual malady. And, um, you know, I can believe in God, and I can be the best churchgoer. I can do, you know, get on my knees 25 do- times a day. That doesn't mean that I don't have the internal spiritual malady, uh, the internal spiritual malady right? And, and I, I found that out because, you know, I'd, I'd been going to church and read the Bible and done all those things and look where I am and sitting in an AA meeting, you know. So I really came to understand that that's what we're talking about is the unmanageability. And so if, that, if those two things are true, then my sponsor pointed out you're beyond human aid. And the book talks about it all over the place, right? We're beyond human aid. And, and so I came in a card-carrying agnostic um, I was willing to prove it. I didn't really know what an agnostic was, but I was a card carrying one, platinum card actually. And you know, like I remember being willing to fight to prove I was an agnostic, you know, like in a militant agnostic, because I was so angry at God for what He had done in my life, you know, with my mom, specifically with my mom. And so I was again at that jumping off point, right? I'm powerless over alcohol. My life's unmanageable, and the only solution for me is a power greater than myself. And so what my sponsor said, well, you get to choose your own power, you know. And um, we were just, this is my wife, Francesca. She spoke here a couple months ago. Some of you guys might remember. We were talking about it this morning, kind of the, the concept of God. And I'm not going to tell you about my concept of God because hopefully you'll find your own concept of God if, if, the, if step one's true for you. And, um, but I got to redefine a God, right? I, I got to make a new God up for myself in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and that took me a while. My sponsor would always pay, take me to page 55 of the big book because I always thought that God was something external. And page 55 tells me that God is deep down within me, right? And so that's one of the reasons we do prayer and meditation, right? Specifically the meditation. And so um, he, he gave me the freedom and, and kind of guided me to find a power that worked for me, you know, God as we understand him. And... Um, and, and so the, the insanity that he talked about was, it's not the crazy th- things that I did when I was drinking, you know, like, and I did some crazy things. I'm sure most of you guys did some crazy things. Otherwise, you wouldn't probably be sitting here tonight. That's not what we're talking about. That's not the insanity we're talking about. The insanity we're talking about is right before I, t- I, I get sober for a period of time, a day, week, month, hours, and... Um, enough for my brain to function and then that thought that kind of that mental obsession kicks in and says dude we're going to drink and I'm stone cold sober I know what the evidence is of when I drink think good things do not happen my life becomes a wreck and yet to so when that with that moment of drink time comes my mind justifies the drink right and I'm stone cold sober before I take the first drink that's insane you know and, and so he helped me see that, like all those times that I didn't want to drink and yet I drank, you know, that somehow, I, uh, you know, I justified the drink and, and that, that, that I was, it was never going to quit until I had access to a power greater than myself, which I would get through the, the rest of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, you know, step three, we made the decision and we made the decision on our knees. He made me get down on my knees, hold hands with him. And which, you know, I mean, holding hands with a guy was one thing standing up, but getting down on your knees and holding hands with a guy was a whole different thing that, a, you know, a young punk of 27 thought he was way above, you know. And, um, but I did it, man. I was, I, was willing to, I was willing to see my, or have a life that was different than what I had. And so we got down on our knees and we said this uh, third step prayer out of the book. And he said, all you've really decided is to take the rest of the steps. Step three is just about a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. If you, if you believe you running the show is a bad idea in your life, how about let's turn your life over to a power greater than yourself and have him, in my case, run your life. And that's what the third step decision was about. Our will, my thinking, and my life, our lives, my actions. So trying to make the decision to turn those over to, the, to God. And then the four through nine, steps four through nine was kind of how we implemented the decision. And he took me through that, right? You know, I did the, um, 
the resentment inventory, the fear inventory, the sex inventory, that was a little light because I was going through a divorce at the time. And so I had to come back to that after a few years of sobriety. And, um, and then I shared that, that inventory with him. And, um, you know, I, rem- I, c- I can vision, I can picture it today. We sat on the beach in L.A. We faced our beach chairs out to the ocean. And I read him this, this inventory. And I, we sat side by side like this. And I'm convinced now that the reason we did that was he didn't want to offend me if he fell asleep during listening to my fifth step. Um, but I shared this, this whole thing, man, out of the big book. He, he made me do it out of the big book, not like some biography and I'm the victim. You know, he, he showed me in that fourth column of the, the, the resentment inventory where I was to blame for the problem in my life. You know, which that was a whole new concept because I'd been blaming everyone else and everything else uh, for the problems in my life. And then he, you know, he helped me see my character defects, right? That my character defects were the cause of the problems in my life, right? And that's what we were identifying in that fourth step. And he showed me a list of my character defects and none of them were very flattering. You know, I'm selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, inconsiderate, um, resentful, of course, fearful, like all the things you don't want to have going on in your life for a good life, right? And so he helped me identify those things, and, and he said, you know, you can't remove those from yourself. We have to go to God in the seventh step to ask God remove those defects of character which stand in the way of your usefulness to God and to your fellows, you know? And what that means is that God will only remove the defects of character that stand in the way of my usefulness to him and to my fellows, not the one I want, the ones that I wanted him to remove. Because apparently those serve some use in these rooms, right? Um, for, for other alcoholics to see that, you know, we, we don't get perfect here for sure. And then um, he made me do the, the eight-step list, man. All the names, the peoples and institutions that I'd harmed, what the harm was, and what I'm going to do to make it right. And um, I truly believe, um, for me, that, like, I didn't have any real hefty amends. Like, I didn't owe $5 million to the IRS or anything. But I, I had enough wreckage. I'd created enough wreckage that I had enough amends to make that um, I could see that by making it right with those people, my life was going to get better for sure. And, um, and so I went back and made those amends. You know, I did them to the best of my ability. And, um, you know, two of the amends I didn't make until I was sober a long time. One was to uh, a boss that I was working for at the time I got sober. Like, <laughs> he paid me to show up at work because that's about all I could do, you know. And um, I was not a good employee. I wasn't, you know, there was nothing good going on with me in that, in that workplace. And so, but it didn't, it wasn't until I was about 16 years sober that I really saw that and went back to the man and made those amends. And the other was to my best friend from college, you know, 20 years sober. I finally went back and made amends to him. And it wasn't because I was unwilling to do it, but like I didn't really see where I'd been harmful to him until I remembered that right before I made my geographic, he was involved in a really bad car accident. He almost died. He, He was almost killed in this car accident. And I didn't even go and visit him once in the hospital, you know. And um, that's where alcoholism takes you, you know. The most, the most important person, I, you know, friend in my life, I can't even go and see when he's on potentially dying. I can't even go visit him in the hospital, you know. And so I, I, 20 years sober, I get to make that right to the best of my ability, man. You know, I'm never going to really make that right. I'm going to... I'm going to acknowledge my fault where I was wrong and say, man, I wish I could show up differently if it ever happens again and I have the opportunity, I will show up differently in your life. You know, 10, 11, and 12, a lot of people talk about them as being the maintenance steps. If I just maintain what I have, I'm going to drink again. The book's real clear that I have to, I have to continue to grow and enlarge my spiritual life right? And if I don't do that, I'm going to drink again. And so behavior that was acceptable even five years ago is no longer acceptable. For sure, behavior, of course, that when I was drinking, but even in sobriety, it has to be progressive for me in sobriety, right? Again, that something that five years ago I was okay with, I'm not okay with today, right? And there's still plenty for me to work on. That's the good news, right? Like, 
we're human, but if we're alcoholic men, we come in with a whole list of wrongs and things that we do wrong and areas of improvement, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I get to work on that every single day. I, I like it, um, you know, the, the 10 step is my walking around step, right? That's how I keep right with my fellows during the day. And then at night, I do my 11th step, right? It says when we, in the big book, it says when we retire at night, we review our day. And that I do with God. So anything that I've missed during the day with my walking around step, with making it right, keeping it right with my fellows, I catch it hopefully with God. It's kind of like a safety net step that I do at the end of the day. And then I might have to go and do some writing or go and make amends or, you know, Shit, I do things right every now and then again too, right? Like I can say, man, good job there. You know, you showed up for someone today that maybe you wouldn't have done five years ago and for sure not before you got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I'm an I'm a AA history buff. or I'm an AA history lover. I wouldn't say I'm a buff. I'm an AA history lover. And um, back in the day before the big book was written, um, there was no big book, right? There was no program. The steps weren't formalized. Um, and we were still struggling, right, financially. Um, the guys were staying, and some women were staying sober, and they were really using the Bible for the most part as their, as their guide before the book was written. And they were desperately trying to get money so that they could get Alcoholics Anonymous going, and specifically by then writing the book. And so they'd gone to John D. Rockefeller, and asked him, for, asked him for money, and he was definitely very interested in what went on in Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank God he gave us only a little bit of money, enough to get us to where we are today. Um, and um, uh, John D. Rockefeller sent a guy from New York to Akron, where Bill Wilson and, and Dr. Bob had met, to kind of do a, a report. He wanted a report. He wanted someone to describe to him what goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so he sent a guy by the name of Frank Amos to Akron, and he spent a, a few weeks there kind of hanging out with all the alcoholics. And he came back and wrote this report and, that went to John D. Rockefeller. And in this report, one of the things that he said, and this is another place where I might piss a few more people off, um, he said that the most important thing that he saw that we did was the quiet time every morning at the beginning of our day. He said that's almost more important than the meetings that the alcoholics have. And the quiet time now we talk about is our 11th step, right? It says on awakening and then it gives us five or six um, paragraphs of directions on what we do first thing in the morning because that's where I set my thinking right for the day. The problem with the alcoholic center is in the mind I need to get my, my, my thinking treated. I came for my drinking, I stayed for my thinking. And so I need to get my thinking right first thing every morning and that's what we do in the 11th step. And, um, and, and that's how important it is, right? And so today I'm pretty blessed. My wife's sober a long time in AA <coughs> as well and we get to do it most mornings together right or we both know whether each other's done it <laughs> right <laughs> right away right which is pretty cool I mean it works out really well for us and um and I truly believe that's almost the single most important action I can do on a daily basis is those paragraphs out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous on uh, 86 87 88 on awakening and those the series of because it even gives me three paragraphs of direction on how to meditate yeah Meditation, by the way, I thought it was kind of like that levitational kind of meditating, which is, I mean, that's certainly a, a form of a meditation. It's not going to work for most alcoholics, right? Like our minds are spinning 100 miles an hour before our eyes have even opened, right? And so one of the, the definitions that I read about um, meditation was a focusing of one's thoughts. And that's what that first part of On Awakening does, is it helped me focus my thoughts on being God-centered for the day, right? And, uh, and if I can do that, anything that comes along that day, God and I can handle. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be tiptoeing through the tulips every day. But I know today that no matter what comes up, if I'm doing the deal, all of the steps, but specifically on awakening, no matter what comes up that day, God and I can walk through it together. Um, and then the 12th step um, by the way, I'm going to say this, the other part of what might piss people off is meetings won't keep me sober. 
There's a kind of a paradox in AA. If I don't go to meetings and they're available to me, I'm going to drink. If I only go to meetings and think that's going to keep me sober, I'm going to drink. Right? So AA is kind of a, it's a recipe. And that's what our big book is. It's a recipe on how to have a spiritual experience, which if I'm back to step one, if I'm powerless over alcohol, my life's unmanageable, I need to have a spiritual experience so that I'm no longer powerless over alcohol. Right? And my life is no longer unmanageable. It'll always be unmanageable by me, drunk or sober. Like I'm 35 years sober. If I stop doing the deal for a month or maybe even two weeks, my head will be so crazy, it's already unmanageable. And it might not have shown up in my actions yet, but trust me, it's going to show up, right? Um, and, you know, things can still get crazy for me. I was telling my wife and Mike, who came up with us tonight, I love to ride a bike. I know Nan does. And um, I'm 62 years old, 35 years sober, riding my bike today, and I almost got into an altercation with a guy <laughs> in a car. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, so it can still be unmanageable sober a long time doing the deal, right? And I did it like an extra hard set of prayers this morning because I knew I was coming up here for you guys. Um, and I still do that kind of behavior. But, you know, the, the 12th step is having had a spiritual awakening. And the second appendix of the big book tells us what a spiritual awakening is, right? It's a personality change sufficient to overcome alcoholism. And if we, it's a, I guarantee it. If you're new here today, if you do the, the, the 12 steps out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor who's done it him or herself, I guarantee you a spiritual experience. I guarantee you a personality change sufficient to overcome alcoholism. And I'll, I'll give you my number. I've got some cards here with my number on it. And if you don't have it, call me up because you'll be the first. Um, and so, you know, I've had the spiritual awakening. You know, my life is, I mean, it's very different. I mean, I've been sober a long time, so it's very different than when I came in. But I don't know. It, it's not like it's... Um, award and an award-winning kind of life you know it's not like i've got the best house in the mansion and the best of everything and the prettiest this and the prettiest that but um i've had the spiritual awakening you know i don't the first thing i'm not thinking about is drinking when i wake up or not drinking or trying to not drink um and we carry this message to alcoholics. And, and, and for me, one of the greatest gifts is, is carrying the message and taking new, new people through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And by the way, it's not limited to alcoholics. <clears throat> I bet there are people in here tonight dying of alcoholism that have probably been sober a while. Because that's what happens, you know. We think that meetings will keep us sober. And they'll keep us away from a drink for a while. They'll give us relief from alcoholism. But it's not, the, um, it's not recovery from alcoholism. Recovery and relief are two different things. And um, we practice these principles in all our affairs. Some days I'm an A and some days I'm a D. Today was mm -mm, C minus after that little incident <laughs> went on my bike. Got it. And it took me about an hour to admit that the dude was right. In my mind, like I was 62 years old, man, I'm ready to get it on with the guy who's probably like 25, you know. <laughs> We didn't get that close. We didn't get that close, but in my mind, if it was coming down, you know, it just crazy stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's never gone. Alcoholism is never gone. I, I just, I'll close with a story. Um, when I was, so I, I told you about my first wife, and I've told you about my beautiful third bride here, uh, Francesca. And my kid, I have uh, three children with my second wife and uh, second ex-wife and um, when I was about 10 years sober we had uh, actually I was about nine years sober when he was born our, our oldest son was born and um, no actually sorry I was about eight years sober when he was born <coughs> and um, shortly after he was born he was diagnosed with uh, leukemia he was a baby and he was diagnosed with leukemia and um, it turned out that he had a very aggressive form of leukemia and um, so we took him, I lived in Salt Lake City at the time, and we took him to the, the really good children's hospital there. And we took him there, and we spent about the next year trying to save his life from leukemia. And, and um, eventually he, he died from the leukemia, and he was about two years old. And, um, um, 
you know, there were a lot of similarities similarities between that and the death of my mom, right? Uh, except I was sober and I had a design for living that worked under all conditions. And here's what I can tell you about the next two years after he died. And even like when, when he was in the hospital, guys would show up from AA, women would show up from AA, like in the, they'd suddenly be in the hospital room with us, helping us out with this, this little guy. And, and showing up at our house and doing stuff around our yard and then our cleaning our house and stuff like that, you know, the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, but after he died, you know, I got really angry at God again. And for about the next two years, I, I walked through what I call a spiritual desert, you know. I did, the, I did my 11th step every morning and every evening, 80% of the time, 90% of the time, whatever it is back then. Um, I did it, but I just went through the motions because I was so angry at God, you know. And I, so my point in telling the story is because, A, it's my experience, but, B, if you're going through something difficult right now or maybe something difficult is in your future and you don't know that yet, my experience is that you can walk through those spiritual deserts and not drink and not even really think about drinking. I'll tell you, uh, I did think about killing myself. <coughs> Because that's always a good out for us, right? A permanent solution to a temporary problem. Um, but at the time, it didn't seem temporary, you know. My my kid's mom and I at the time, we actually had a discussion about driving our car into a pylon, a concrete pylon, and just ending it because we had no other children. And we thought it would never end, right? The pain. And um, we didn't, and thank God we didn't. And um, so, but after about two years, I woke up one morning and I said, you know what, I can be angry, at bitter, angry and bitter at God for the rest of my life, or I can just accept this as God's will for me. I don't like it. doesn't mean I have to like it. doesn't mean I have to want it or anything like that, but I do need to accept it, or else I'm going to be an angry, miserable dude the rest of my life. And, um, and that's my experience is, you know, we can get through those things together, and no matter what you've got going on in your life. You know, if you... If you bounced a check this morning or, you know, if you've got someone dying in your life, no matter what it is, we can get through it together. So, again, I want to thank Nan for asking me to speak. It's um, always an honor and a privilege because of this life. The single most important thing for me is my relationship with the God, of my understanding that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me, and I need to do this in order to maintain that. So, thanks.